people don't like comparing athletes to slaves. And I get the obvious reasons why that comparison isn't a one to one example. But what they often miss in fighting against that comparison is that the psychological framework of what makes sports appealing, especially for a lot of white fans of these types of sports, is definitely rooted in a racist, anti-black and plantation mentality. That these players, whether they're highly skilled or lowly skilled, whether they are boy scouts or predators, as long as they reproduce a particular framework of white supremacist hierarchy, they're fine. And as soon as they're not, then there's a problem. This is Seku. He is my oldest son. He likes Minecraft and soccer and basketball. And I'm almost positive he's a future shonen protagonist, at least in his own mind. He's super competitive. He loves family time. He's passionate and sensitive, and he's almost always in a good mood. Personality wise, he's actually a lot like his mom in that regard. But physically, he's a lot like his dad. Seku, like me, is low cut. Even at eight, you can see power and thickness in his legs and his torso. He's strong and quick, though unfortunately, much like his dad, he's pretty uncoordinated, at least right now. It's quite possible that Seiku could grow up to be a great athlete. He already loves sports, and he's kind of a natural for being on a team with his level of competitiveness and his passion and positivity. But from the day I knew the sex of my child, I was immediately wary about sports for him to the point where I purposefully avoided engaging him with any sports for most of his life. Seiku barely touched a basketball or football or soccer or anything till he was almost six years old. In retrospect, that's probably why he's so uncoordinated now. This is the opposite of how I was raised. I came from an extended family of athletes in a city where Michael Jordan was the GOAT, but Mike Dicker was God. My brother was a really good high school athlete that played football at the college level. My sister broke state records in track and almost made it to the Olympics. Many of my cousins were accomplished in sports, but me, I was really good at Tekken. I just, I've never been too competitive, which is good because I've also never been all that athletic. But you wouldn't be able to tell from how I look. In fact, especially when I was younger and less flabby, you'd have sworn I was a good athlete to the point where I remember vividly when I was the same age of my son, only eight, that I would have adult men approach me and ask me if I played football or wanted to play for their little league team. They would say things like, you got the body of a football player, which I didn't understand much then, I understand better now, but then and now, it was a little weird, a little, little weird. I think it akin to how a lot of girls feel when they start getting older and people start looking at their bodies in a sexualized fashion. It's that first moment where as a child, you recognize that your body is something else to other people and you have no control or say in that. It's that first feeling of being objectified. And it's something that we don't talk about a lot for boys, especially black boys, and we should. See, the reason why I'm worried about Seku and my younger son, Rohan, getting involved in sports is because I recognize that although sports are great, there's a lot beneath the surface there. I spent 10 years teaching high school and I had a lot of football players that came through my classroom. And although plenty were affable, well-adjusted young men, even some of them that were from tougher backgrounds, there were clearly a lot of them who were underdeveloped mentally, emotionally, some of them under a ton of pressure that was affecting their mental health. And almost all of them were comfortable in this unique space of objectification that black boys and men sometimes enter maybe even willingly, because that's the script that society often tends to tell us to read from. Sports can serve as a beacon to bring men and boys together where they can safely explore a fuller range of humanity and emotions. Through sports, men can appreciate platonic, non-sexual intimacy between other boys and connect with other men and make meaningful bonds coming together for positive reasons for the most part, because there are those other parts. 
There's the exploitative industry surrounding it that feeds on the life force of these boys and men. There's the macho culture underneath a lot of sports communities that's intertwined with it, that promotes that destructive behavior that harms some of these men and boys in the long run, let alone the communities they belong to and come from. And there are parts of sports that destroy these boys and men's bodies, both physically and mentally. But despite all of this, again, you'll see me live tweeting about the Bears on Sundays, proclaiming my aberration for LeBron James and losing my shit at my son's soccer games. Everybody, this is Kirkwood. Uh, he seems to like to sit with me when I try to record. This is maybe the fifth time I've tried to record this and the last three times this has happened. Yes, yes, I, okay. You can't be purring on camera. We take for granted how deep and complex the world of athletics and that space of being an athlete is to black men. And don't engage with all the themes and lessons to be found within. So today, that's what I'm gonna do. We're going to explore the precarious nature of the black male athlete. We're gonna look into the concepts of plantation sports and the culture that surrounds this unique space where black men are at once rewarded and deified by this athletic masculine persona, but at the same time dehumanized and debased into essentially animalistic embodiments of non-humanity. And once again, I brought in some folks with much greater knowledge of this experience and the challenges connected to it. First up is Arian Foster. Arian played eight years in the NFL, was a four-time pro bowler, and was one of the best running backs in the league for the bulk of his career. The other great thing about Arian is that during and after his career, he's been very outspoken about social justice issues. He's dabbled in streaming, podcasting, and general social commentary. And what's really useful with Arian is that he can provide this firsthand experience of the level of sacrifice that you have to put in for being an athlete of his caliber starting at a very young age. I came from nothing. Like, I'm talking about food stamps, EBT cards. Like, I don't even know if they do EBT cards anymore, but I came from that. I think initially, right, because I grew up in the circumstances I grew up in, my entire goal was to get out of it, right? It was just to leave. It was to, I don't care what I gotta do and who I gotta kill, I'm gonna get up out of here. That's your mindset. All of the emotional toll that you accrue throughout that time, it takes a back seat to the goal. Um, and that's dangerous. The, the detriment I did to my emotional health and mental health throughout that entire journey, college and pro, man, I, there's a lot of things like I wish I could do differently, man. What Arian's getting at here, I think, is where I want to start. This headspace that young black boys have to enter into to prepare themselves for the level of exploitation and sacrifice that they have to put themselves through in order to seek out a career as a professional athlete. As Arian mentioned, and as I alluded to with myself and my son, early on, black boys begin to internalize the limitations the world has in seeing them as fully human, or at least even just as themselves. Black boys and black children in general suffer with what social scientists call adultification, which is basically when children are assigned psychological and physical features of adults when they're children based on social, racial, and ethnic biases. For black girls, this tends to happen around sexuality. Black girls are seen as older, less innocent, less worthy of protection. This same phenomenon was relevant with Tamir Rice, the 12 year old black boy who was shot by police back in 2016. Tamir Rice was only 12 years old and was playing with a toy gun out in the field when the police were called and the police pulled up on him and shot him immediately, assuming that this was a black man with a gun. Shot fired, male down, um, black male. Maybe 20. But in this case, when you talk about adultification, what I really think about is how we've normalized black children in general, but especially black boys taking on adult masculine embodiments in terms of their maturity or their character or their work ethic, things that are championed in sports. But what can happen is that this identity of being a young athlete and being a leader and possibly a future provider or commodity in a household overpowers their identity of just being a child. In those first few years where a black boy plays a sport, he's probably just a kid having fun at most idolizing and imitating the sports stars that he sees on TV. But at some point when somebody notices that a boy has this natural talent, he goes from being a kid playing a game to a prospective commodity. Thus, we might see boys as young as 12 or 13 years old begin to carry the pressure and weight of professional athletics 
but without the compensation. Take for instance the story of Eddie Curry, a story I kind of witnessed firsthand. Eddie Curry played in the NBA for 11 years from 2011 to 2012, but before then, he was a really big kid from my hometown right outside of Chicago, Illinois. And he and I actually went to the same schools from elementary until I graduated from high school a year before he did. I vividly remember the first time seeing Eddie when I was a fourth grader. And when you're like a little kid, psychologically you correlate size with authority because the adults are the people in charge and the adults are all bigger than you. But I remember when I saw Eddie, he was as big as any adult in the school and my brain just could not compute how this kid who was as big as other adults was also younger than me. That said, I wanna make sure it's clear, I was not friends with Eddie Curry in high school or middle school, but it was impossible not to know who he was. Like I may have shared one or two words with him over the course of those years going to school with him, but you knew that at some point in time, this guy that was walking through the school at six foot 11, 300 pounds was gonna be a millionaire NBA athlete. That's just what you understood from the outside looking in. However, the actual story for Eddie is unfortunately much darker and ugly. Eddie never really panned out in the NBA. He struggled with his health and suffered significant personal tragedy during his playing time, something that he wrote about in a blog post for the Players' Tribune. In this post, he talks about all the difficult things that his career in basketball brought to him. But for me, the most heartbreaking part was when he had to stop being a kid and start being a prospect. When I was a kid, I just wanted to play video games and ride bikes and hang out with my friends. I actually tried to avoid hoops. What did me in, though, was that I was tall. When middle school rolled around, my friends started talking constantly about how I should play basketball. Every day they pressured me to try out for the seventh grade team and for a while I actually managed to resist. But before you know it, word gets out about the huge kid playing at Dirksen and I have AAU dudes showing up at my house to recruit me and meet my parents. And me, I'm just totally not into it. The first one of those visits I'll never forget. While the coaches are there making a pitch to my mom, I'm sitting on the floor playing with a toy train set. The whole time I'm fiddling with those trains just kind of thinking to myself, that sounds like a terrible idea. I'm not signing up for no AAU team. That seems like a damn job. It was like, how about you just let me play with my trains and leave me be? In the end, it was Eddie's mother who decided that she would essentially become a professional basketball player at 13. A hard but understandable decision that robbed Eddie of his childhood, but positioned him to make immense life-changing generational wealth. There is a complex dynamic in play for parents who have to decide what's best for their hyper-talented child athletes. Elvion Brule is a sports agent and author who has managed numerous pro football players and written two books hoping to guide mothers of athletes through the complex pathway of prep and college sports. 70% of student athletes that attend um, Division I football or play Division I football, I should say, in the NCAA, um, come from a single parent household. And majority in, in that are women and majority um, are women of color. And so it, 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 it's real. I, I wrote that in my book. I have a whole chapter that's geared towards uh, mental health. I tell parents all the time, like at the end of the day, they're humans first. And we're in an industry that objectify them in a way that sometimes we act like they're not humans. And you know, this is not always on the institutions. Sometimes I've been at Pee Wee Park ball games and watch a parent say, yeah, he's four running, talking about, yeah, he's gonna buy me a house when he go to the NFL. That's the thing. A lot of this sentiment is also seen in sociologist Scott M. Brooks' book, Black Man Can't Shoot, where he follows several young boys as an AAU coach and mentor, documenting the nature of these boys' journey to pursue collegiate and hopefully professional athletic careers. Within this time, he explains the complex set of relationships and dynamics in play for these boys coming from impoverished environments and their need to effectively engage in professional work all for the goal of accessing opportunity. And not just an opportunity in terms of money, but an opportunity to reframe their identity away from the common stereotypes of black men and boys into something that is revered, not just in the black community, but presumably in the world as a whole. Black men have a unique socioeconomic position. They are not considered real men, at least by the standards of masculinity set by the wider society. Young black males do not wholly accept this presumption of criminality 
nor do they see themselves as failures. Instead, they see society as skewed and opportunities largely determined by factors beyond their control. Thus, they imagine how they might succeed via mainstream paths and institutions. Young men in South Philly become basketball players because it is a positive identity, an alternative to being in the street and a possible means of escaping poverty. So overall, this idea of just putting a child who has great talent into this athletic identity and persona, though costing possibly that child's youth, still seems like not such a problematic idea because the opportunities that may come from that, especially if that child is coming from poverty, will be life-changing. However, this does not happen in a vacuum, and there are social and financial economies that are built on and around these boys, even at the lowest level. Even the ones who are only marginally talented prospects to make it to those higher levels are still highly valued commodities in these youth sports economies. Basketball players as young as 13 will travel the country and practice dozens of hours a week for AAU basketball. Football players are scooped up to attend private academies, are constantly going to football camps to try to associate themselves with high level football programs. The stakes are much higher than people think, even at this low level. For a boy, though, it's still pretty simple. Do whatever you want so you can get out of poverty or attain this identity using your body. But for the parents, it's still super complex. First, you have to navigate this winding web of maximizing opportunities for your child, protecting your child, and at the same time, figuring out what you're doing as a parent. And we see this in the media manifested in movies like Blue Chips. Blue Chips is a 1994 movie starring Nick Nolte and an ensemble cast. Nolte plays Pete Bell, a winning basketball coach who hasn't won a lot lately because he just doesn't have good enough players to compete with his competition. What he realizes is that the competition is getting the best players because they're cheating. They're providing illegal benefits to these players to get them to sign with their team. And Bell doesn't want to do this. We'll get to that a little later when we get to the NCAA. I know the amount of money that it's going to take to buy out your contract is the same that it's going to take to get Butch and Ricky to sign letters of intent. We don't buy athletes. However, it becomes clear to Bill that he's going to have to play the game in order to win the game. And he eventually meets up with Alfie Woodard's character, who plays the mother of a generational basketball prospect. She puts up a stern and incisive front to the numerous old men looking to come recruit her son and also illegally charges $1,000 just to talk to him. And when Nick Nolte tries to guilt her into rejecting these illegal actions that benefit her, she comes with, I think, the best possible statement you can come when somebody tries to sell you on some bullshit. Miss McRae, do you really want your son to start out life by learning how to bend and break the rules? I mean, what's he going to be when he grows up and then he's out in the world? Now he's responsible and the leader of other young men. What's he going to become? I mean it. Mothers are a huge deal in this world because unfortunately for a lot of these young black athletes, they are coming from fatherless households. However, despite their possibly being a fatherless household, it does not mean that other black men are not stepping up to play a father's role in these boys' lives. In the documentary More Than a Game, which looks at the high school career of LeBron James, Drew Joyce, the mentor and high school coach of LeBron James, talks about how difficult it was for him to be a father figure to all these boys, but also coach them, including his own son, Drew Joyce Jr. I was very hard on him, and uh, it... It hurt our relationship. For a long time, it wasn't father or son. It was coach player. Sometimes he'd break me down in the game and I couldn't get through it. Maybe I went overboard. I had enough sense one time to ask Drew if I was being too hard on him. And he told me yes. This creates a complex dynamic for a lot of these black men who are coaching and training and supporting these young black athletes. The outcomes can vary greatly. A lot of men lead into tough love, which might definitely result in success for young black athletes, but can also make it easier for them to buy into their own dehumanization. And the culture is abusive in nature. Like, and I, I can hear it now when I, when I whenever I, criticize the culture of football like there's always critics that say oh it's soft the boys need it and I'm like listen bro I used to I used to get in trouble with my coaches all the time because they would they, be, they would be motherfucking you motherfucker you man you gotta fucking run and you gotta do that and I used to be like dog listen all you gotta do is tell me what I gotta do 
you don't got to yell at me. Like that shit, I don't know why you feel like you, like that's cool. These older black men are often in tough positions because a lot of us are coming from the perspective that we were given to have to break down young black boys and discipline them and give them tough love in order for them to be strong enough to deal with the reality that is growing up as a black man in America. At the same time, the results of that aren't always the greatest. And you can see that there's better ways of doing that. You have guys like Jason Wilson, who's a karate teacher in Detroit, who can teach all of these conservative ideologies of discipline and responsibility, but you don't see him yelling and being extra towards his youth. It's a complex situation, but even when it's not done perfectly, you can at least appreciate when you know it's being done in the benefit of the child. Because the reality is there are countless entities seeking to exploit these boys even before they get to college and you don't ever know who you're dealing with as a parent or a teacher or a coach. One example being the Bishop Sycamore scandal from this past year that was covered by Flimlo Raps, a football and lifestyle creator who makes long form examinations of college and NFL athletes, but humanizes them in a way that most people don't. And more practically, how do I operate within that? Right. You feel me? So right. now, you understand what's going on. You know Nick Saban don't love you. He'll right. love you, man. He, he he doing his job. You do your job. So you respect him. You show him respect. You do what you're supposed to do. But the whole time, you get your NIL money. You stack that up. You take that class that they told you you really didn't need because you want that for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You journal. You you have to you have to basically invest in yourself and put the knowledge in yourself. Mm -hmm. And all the information on the internet at this point, the only thing is. I don't think most athletes understand that it's necessary and that the colleges ain't going to do it, bro. And it ain't even really their job. You know yeah. what I'm saying? They can't do it. Like, they can't teach you about black consciousness. Like, because they're not that. You know what I'm saying? They're not even there for that. They're there right. for a whole other thing. There are so many families and mothers of these talented boys flailing at anything that they think can provide opportunities for their sons. Thus, so much power is put into the hands of these types of coaches and it can be difficult to know if you're giving your kid over to a coach carter coach carter being the legendary basketball coach over in california that was well known for putting discipline and character and education over basketball versus david bliss david bliss was the head coach of the baylor university basketball team in waco texas from 1999 to 2003. in 2003 one of the baylor players patrick dennehy was killed by his friend and teammate carlton dotson this story, I still don't really know all the details on it. It's a complex and tragic situation. Dotson was said to be going through a psychotic break at the time. Him and Dennehy were fearing for their lives for some reason, which caused them to buy firearms. And they were at a fire range when they got into an argument and Dotson shot Dennehy. Overall, it's a tragic situation, but the ugly part is what David Bliss did after the fact because he realized he needed to save his ass. See. David Bliss was illegally paying the tuition of both of these players out of pocket to get them on the team. And I'll talk later about how I really don't care about breaking NCAA rules, but when it was time for him to cover his tracks after this incident, Bliss decided to fabricate a story that the altercation was a dispute over a drug issue. This is off camera, but he was selling drugs. He sold to all the white guys on campus. Patrick so, doing he was selling drugs? Oh yeah. I mean, you don't think I, I'm, yeah, he, he was the worst. No, I never, I haven't found that. I know yet, I know, but I'm telling you. He tried to get the rest of his team to go along with the story, including one of his coaches who eventually blew the whistle on the whole thing. Also, at the same time, he was trying to coerce the families of these two young men to lie and say that they were paying the tuition. The saddest thing, the thing that kind of shows you how perilous this reality of being coached and being in sports is, is that this dude, David Bliss, never went to jail for anything and kept coaching at various levels until 2018. That coach young athlete relationship is incredibly critical because it can dictate a lot of the future outcomes for these boys heading into these complex and in many ways perilous situations. But going back to my first point, even when everything is great, when you have a strong support system and good coaching and positivity surrounding this child, we are still talking about a child. Going back to the LeBron documentary, you can see that somewhere along the line, LeBron had received immense coaching on responding to the media, being a leader and keeping his emotions in check and just generally trying to avoid making the normal mistakes that a teenage boy should be able to make. 
LeBron spoke of turning to marijuana as a way of managing this type of pressure and anxiety because LeBron James was an international superstar at 16. And we forget that for every LeBron James or Kevin Garnett, there's a Lenny Cook or a Ronnie Fields, young black boys who didn't have that support system or just weren't as lucky as LeBron and Kevin to make it that far without falling into these traps. And the scary thing for a guy like Ronnie Fields or Lenny Cook is that though that potential, all that sacrifice from childhood, if you don't make it, you don't make it and you don't get that time back. At the same time, LeBron was lucky enough to skip probably the most perilous and exploited the time frame for these boys, which is their time in collegiate sports. For those lucky few that are good enough to make it to college and be college athletes, the grinder really begins. While in youth sports, they're still under the care of adults, but in college, they're expected to act independently and as adults, all while having more freedom and more temptation with less oversight and higher stakes. All the while making billions of dollars that they never get a real fraction of. So let's finally talk about the most unabashedly awful corporate entity in the United States, the NCAA. And it's hard to even know where to start here. While originally the NCAA was meant to govern fairness in college athletics, and that makes sense. There's awesome stories you could find on like secret base about the crazy things people did to cheat in college sports in like the 20s or whatever. But since the 70s and the 80s, the NCAA has really one job, which is to make as much money as it can for itself and these colleges. And all of that is possible because the college players who make up this billion dollar industry never see any direct profit off of even their own names and likenesses until recently. And understand the new name and likenesses laws, uh, which I'll get into later. Like for the longest time, you could, as a college football player, have your name on the back of your jersey, have your school sell your jersey with your name on it, and then not have to pay you a dime for it. 22nd ranked Georgia will have to get by without star receiver A.J. Green for a while. The wideout was suspended by the NCAA for four games Wednesday for selling his jersey from last season's Independence Bowl for $1,000 to someone who qualifies as an agent. And make no mistake, we are talking about college football and basketball. There are 20 some odd NCAA sports and no disrespect to baseball players and water polo, or whatever, but all the money is coming from black bodies that put on cleats and shoot free throws. It is what it is. And also that means we have to start talking about the man behind the curtain. In the program, probably one of the most underrated football movies of all time, the movie starts with a rich white coach losing the last game of a season and then immediately has to answer to his older, richer, whiter, overseer in the form of an athletic director who complains about the fact that their old rich white overseers aka donors benefactors and corporate sponsors don't like the team losing and so the solution that all these white men have is to go find young black boys to play on the team two so-so seasons is having a damaging effect on our fundraising the alumni in the legislature are unhappy and they vote with their checkbooks and in the program, he does this. He finds Darnell Jeffrey, your typical elite athlete from an impoverished and rough background, looking to use his athleticism to pull himself out of poverty. And like I said, makes perfect sense. The movie doesn't spend a lot of time talking about Darnell alone. It's an omnibus of stories all connecting to the concept of the program, these big college football programs with all these moving features and intertwining and concerning stories. And it's no coincidence that this team from the movie is clearly based off the Florida State Seminoles of the 90s, which were coached by Bobby Bowden, who recently died. In fact, Bobby Bowden's death was the reason why I thought to make this video, because after Bobby Bowden died, there was, you know, the usual outcry of man what a great winner and what a great coach and yada 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 and Bobby Bowden was one of the most unabashedly corrupt coaches of his time frame and especially in Florida which in the 90s and 80s that was just like Florida college football was insane there aren't a lot of clear stories on the crazy stuff that happened and what's true and what's not true but I imagine the type of stuff they depicted in the program is tame compared to what was happening in real life You've been seeing players get exploited, used, abused too long now for you not at this point to say, hold up, you know, I've watched kids, literally, I swear to you, this just happened recently. Somebody warned them, listen, that agent did X, Y, Z. You know, you might've won a second guess. And some, they still go mess with the agent. Then it happens to them. And then it's like, you know, what do y'all think y'all above it? I mean, it's a business. And at the end of the day, 
I love these universities, but they're going to always do what's best for the university. It's kind of sense. The only other black player of note is Alvin Mack, who I think is still a very interesting and probably one of my favorite characters in the history of football movies. Mack looks and acts like most of the other meatheads on the team, but it's clear he's highly intelligent. He seems like he has damn near a photographic memory, but he's definitely not using that to worry about school. And it's really some anti-black plantation mentality shit that we look at him not caring about school as like a character flaw when he's clearly there to play football. And this is something that he himself also understands. Which two city states fought in the Punic Wars? I don't know. Detroit and Buffalo. Oh, come on, Alvin. You're gonna be tested on this. <laughs> Rookies, you pay attention. This is what I expect out of you. Alvin, you ready? Yes, sir. All right, this is Mississippi State's offensive set. Second and two on our own 24. What defensive set might we call? Eagle Zipper Hero, unless the setback shifts into the eye. Good. Third and seven. Oki Thunder Lion. What's your assignment? Kill the quarterback. And what I appreciate is that the film doesn't explicitly depict this as a bad thing. There is a moralistic lesson of sorts that tries to come across when Mac is injured and thus loses his prospective career. But we kind of also get the idea that something with Mac is going to give and he'll figure it out. Alvin Mac, uh, that linebacker again from the program, the dude was when they asked him his assignments, like as middle linebacker, you boom, boom, boom. I got this. I got this. I got this. He was clearly intelligent. Right. He was flunking all his classes, though. <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> Why? It's because he didn't care about he was never interested in that. Right. You feel me? And no professor, no teacher, no uh, curriculum ever found like a common ground for him, found a way to connect what he cares about to right. this curriculum so that he could better understand it, get into it and then develop these other skills with, um, with Omar Epps. When Omar Epps was like, bro, I got the $50. And he was like, my brother, he was like, we, we ain't supposed to get this 50. He was like, bro, you better take that damn 50. You know what I'm saying? You better understand, like, you know, you can't live off the little stipend that they're giving you. Take that 50 and you're going to get way more when you play better. You know what I'm saying? He understood that the game was messed up, but he still will operate within it. You know what I'm saying? It's not perfect, but when you compare it going back to blue chips, right? In Blue Chips, Pete Bell is clearly unhinged as a coach. And the movie depicts him as the moral center, as the good guy surrounded by a bad system. But the bad system in this case is people gaming the NCAA. At the end of the movie, after cheating against his will to try to compete, Pete Bell breaks down in a press conference and tells the truth about all the different things happening at his basketball program in order for them to win. And it's treated as this tragedy when really motherfucker was just snitching because what Pete Bell really was insinuating is that the status quo in which these young men and boys play for free for this billion dollar industry, that that's the right way to do things. Corruption in the form of paying players under the table is incredibly widespread in the NCAA. I can provide a list as long as my arm of the various stories you can find out here on YouTube alone about how these players are coming to these schools because they're getting money and the schools know it. The other schools know it. And the NCAA doesn't know it, but the motherfuckers know it. I was like, yeah, I took money under the table. I was like, there isn't a, a big time or even mid tier college athlete. I know that didn't take money under the table. And and when I did that, it, I was trending on Twitter. Like it was like a big deal. This is a this is a labor issue, right? This is a labor issue. And what what bothers the shit out of me is they have hoodwinked our brothers and our sisters into believing that you should not have fair compensation for your labor. And the truth is, they don't care because at the end of the day, they still get what they want, which is free labor from these boys. Because how can you call it corruption in such an exploitative system? Is it corrupt for these players who don't get long term benefits, don't get long term insurance for the injuries that they get while playing this game and don't get paid while they're doing it? And on campus, they get barely anything just to live. Why shouldn't they find a way to benefit from their labor? Is it not corrupt to organize ways to cheat for these students when they can't fake it legally? According to the NCAA, give a fuck. In 2017, the NCAA completed an investigation of a well-documented academic fraud tradition at the University of North Carolina. While there was a mountain of evidence that the school was cooking the books in order to keep their athletes eligible, the NCAA did nothing because at the end of the day, the players weren't getting paid, so everything was okay. 
I'm not trying to poo-poo getting a college education. There are many players in the NCAA basketball, football, that get a college education that is very valuable to them, that they use outside in the real world to go on to do great things. That's a real thing that I wish was more understood by more parents and young athletes, that being a pro football player or a pro basketball player doesn't have to be the end result of exploiting your own athletic ability. For those boys who are there just for the sport, who are there trying to escape from poverty and looking for a greater opportunity structure, there's no excuse for them not getting paid in the process. Meanwhile, Lincoln Riley, the new coach of the USC Trojans, just signed a contract to pay him over $10 million a year. I, my coach, my head coach had a Lexus deal. My, my dog pulled up to practice every day, parking spot, save for an Alexis every single day. And I'm like, I gotta see this shit? You know what I mean? Other coaches pulling up in spaceships. And I'm like, yo, fuck this. I, it, it made me very apathetic, right? It made me very apathetic to everything. Right? Yeah. So like the, the core values that I was brought up with kind of took a back seat because I was born in poverty and here I am in college still in poverty, right? Uh, yeah. And 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 it, I, it just, I just became infuriated. And so um, navigating that space mentally, um, it wasn't an option. Kirk Herbstreit accused players that skip bowl games, meaningless, unpaid bowl games that make money for the schools, but not the players that these guys just don't love football. And that's true. A lot of these players don't love football. What they love is the opportunity that football provides. And playing in a whole extra game, unpaid, as all the previous games, makes no fucking sense. And I completely agree with any player that decides that they're going to skip the playoffs if they're not playing for a championship or if they simply just don't want to do it. What Herb Street is getting at is a plantation mentality that really starts to occur at the college level. It develops a little bit in prep sports because that's where a lot of these players and kids start to have to prepare their heads for being in this space. But once they get to college, the plantation shit really starts. And there's a lot of people that don't like that comparison. They don't like comparing these athletes to slaves because they're well taken care of and they get opportunities. And of course, it's not the vicious reality of what chattel slavery was. When we talk about the plantation, we're not talking about the actual physical and material conditions. What we're talking about is the systemic and psychological reality that those players have to exist in, the way they're treated, the way they're neglected, and the way they're cast aside when it's more convenient for the school or the system. One way in particular that all this craziness manifests is in the precarious sexual activity that some of these players participate in. In a study of sexual behavior of college football players, the following passage was a direct quote from a black football player. The way they call it here, it's a panty dropper. I don't know why, but this one time I was at the club just a random night and some girl came up to me and asked who I was. The minute I told her, and I kid you not, she literally dragged me into the girl's bathroom and she just kind of had her way with me. She was like, I always wanted to be with a football player like you. That was what we call cleat chasers. That's the term we have among football players and we know all you have to do is talk to that girl and it's game over. In the context of this passage, it's pretty clear that the player in question saw this sexual exchange as consensual, but it underscores a concerning reality that is often left unengaged with when we hear about some of the more concerning and problematic behaviors of these athletes, especially these black athletes and black men's sexual behavior in general which is that this population as a whole is exposed to unhealthy sexual activity at a very high rate. The woman in question in this quote did not see this player as a person, but as an object or tool through which to have a sexual experience. And this is not unique to athletes. This is something that a lot of regular ass black men deal with that has barely made a blip on the radar. At the same time, the mentality developed by players like this, where you have women who only see you as a sexual object can easily lead you to certain behaviors, activities and situations that can be anywhere between problematic to outright criminal. A lot of media literature and even academic study is overly comfortable with reproducing myths about the sexual behavior of black men and labeling us as hypersexual when really there's an untold element of fetishization about black men's bodies that accounts for, I think, so much of any data around black men's sexual behavior. 
But a lot of this research never really accounts for the way black men's bodies are fetishized and how that continuous fetishization, which starts again in childhood, alters the way in which black men see sex as a whole. When I read this passage, what it sounded like to me was that this man was assaulted. And I've experienced stuff like this. A lot of black men have. But because we're rarely allowed to engage with that reality of sexual victimization, many of us learn to just play into these behavioral scripts. And in turn, we often learn very early to reject sexual agency within ourselves of fear of being seen as less than or deviant or possibly even criminal. At the same time, despite the complexity of this situation, we have to recognize that sexual assault is a serious issue in collegiate sports. A USA Today study showed that college athletes were three times as likely to commit sexual assault than regular students, with football players being responsible for the vast majority of that increase. Further, the nature of college sports consistently protects many of these athletes from consequences of such behavior. And then we have to again think about this plantation psychology. Under a white supremacist capitalist patriarch, where black men are debased into a subhuman status, as long as their role as athletes or whatever is intact, and is in support of these patriarchal systems, any harm done towards women, especially black women, will go unaddressed and even be seen as broken eggs in an omelet, a means to an end. And this is clear from the historical way these colleges have handled sexual misconduct for athletes. However, this is a well-known and well-trodden reality in the what we also have to contend with is that this same dehumanized status also lends itself to a culture where these black men are themselves exposed to sexual violence. And I'm not just talking about the types of iffy situations that I referred to earlier. For example, most people know about the Jerry Sandusky case because it involved children. But there are currently class action lawsuits against both Michigan University and Ohio State University, two legendary college sports and football programs, because for decades they had team doctors that sexually abused and assaulted hundreds of young men over the course of decades. Richard Strauss, who died in 2005, worked for 20 years at OSU. The school says more than 100 people, including former athletes and patients at Student Health Services, have now come forward accusing him of abuse. Fellow athletes, that Dr. Strauss touched him inappropriately while treating a cold in 1982. And they started laughing and they were like, ah, you got hit, you're a rookie, you didn't know. And I was like, what, no what? And they were like, you could go to him for a hangnail and he has to check your testicles. And Everything. they just laughed about it. Yeah, they this. laughed about it. As in, it's absurd and it's like, you got hit, you're a rookie, okay, welcome to the club. Like, we all went through it. We kind of validate each other. Right. Because a lot of these boys embody this stoic or imposing or exciting image of masculinity, we don't recognize how precarious of a situation many of them are actually in. It's that hidden vulnerability of boys that paradoxically makes them both more prone for predatory behavior, but also more prone to be victimized by the same power structure that protects them. They fully buy into their celebrity status. And unfortunately, the data shows that this is clearly more of a thing for football players who most perfectly embody this hyper-masculine persona compared to other sports. Like college track and basketball are just as dominated by black men and boys as football, but they have a fraction of the issue with sexual assault. Wrestling is just as violent and also has its fair share of black athletes, but it's even lower than track in terms of sexual misconduct. It's those intersecting elements of masculinity, racism, objectification, and that element of celebrity and gladiator status that makes this unique problem. And the mindfuck of it all is that because these young boys are celebrated in such a classically patriarchal way, that a lot of them don't recognize what's happening to them until it's too late. I vividly remember watching the game where Marcus Lattimore, who at the time was shaping up to be probably a first round pick and one of the better running backs in the NCAA, took a hit to his leg that left it dangling and flopping on the ground. I'll never forget the look of shock on his face. Despite the fact that his kneecap was sideways and that he had just torn three ligaments in his knee, LaMarcus was in silent shock. Less than a year away from the NFL draft, his dream was over and this was the last game he ever played in. But the other thing I remember from that is the look of shock on the other players' faces. The fact that these student athletes who didn't have real insurance, who didn't have benefits that would follow them after their playing careers were over if they didn't make it to the NFL, recognized that they were one play away of the exact same fate of being retired at the age of 20 and possibly for some of them heading back home to poverty. They're going to give you enough 
to keep you healthy enough to get the job done that need to be done. And they do treat you like cattle. I said that when I when I quit football like years ago. I said that then. Cause I, and I felt like that and I didn't really know how true it was. I thought I was just like bitter or angry or something like that. But when you, when you're trying to like think, bro, like that's, it literally just come down to that. And you're trying to be like a, a individual on a football team. It is very difficult to do. And to be completely honest, I don't know the answer to this because when you are like, when you don't think, and when you kind of become, you kind of get into that whole brainwash thing, do my job answer question politically correct you know xyz it's successful on the football field for the ncaa so it's like you already setting a standard and bar low to allow them to play because to me that's the thing that incentivizes them it's like okay you want to play well you have to bring these grades up right because that's important if you have the base most of these kids don't have the base to go to college to get a degree that would allow them to have a decent career so they go and take these bald you know like these washed up degrees or most of them do kinesiology and when you ask them what that is or what you could do or what kind of job you can get with that they can't even answer you they don't know they're just taking what they was told or they're doing what they saw these other athletes do or they're taking the easier route right and that's the problem we're not equipped in them enough to say listen you have to be, you could be an engineer sociologist anthony lamell jr has this to say Similar to women, black male bodies became to be possessed objects. Initially, the possession was literal since European Americans bought and sold black male bodies in the slave market. By the time of the civil rights movement, a total system organized to ensure the status of black males, the system of buying and selling black athletes, was well organized. And this reintroduced the slave market exchange of buck embodiments. That word buck is ugly. It's an ugly word that I hate hearing for numerous reasons. But it's an accurate depiction of the systemic nature of how these sports treat young black males. Buck is the classical term used to describe young, able-bodied black male slaves. People don't like comparing athletes to slaves, and I get the obvious reasons why that comparison isn't a one-to-one -one example. But what they often miss in fighting against that comparison is that the psychological framework of what makes sports appealing, especially for a lot of white fans of these types of sports, is definitely rooted in a racist, anti-black and plantation mentality that these players, whether they're highly skilled or lowly skilled, whether they are Boy Scouts or Predators, as long as they reproduce a particular framework of white supremacist hierarchy, they're fine. And as soon as they're not, then there's a problem. So take the lack of agency and the horrors of slavery out of it for a second, because that is completely reasonable. What people want here is the reproduction and reification of a hegemony that puts black bodies below white bodies, especially below the bodies of white men. And for the most part, that's not done through physical means, but through the ability for white hegemonic masculinity to control black masculinity, to tell it where to go, to tell it how much is going to be paid or if it's going to be paid at all. Some of these guys, you see what their bodies look like? It's so, it's so ridiculous. Like, like they, they live on fish and rice. I mean, Frank went there, it's so poor. And he said, you just see dudes where you're like, well, if I had a body like that, I would never wear clothes. Sociologist Abby Ferber wrote in a 2007 paper examining white supremacy and black athletes that many whites in the United States have grown up fearing the power of black male bodies, being anxious about their sexual capacities and being fascinated by their movements. Ironically, this aspect of racial ideology has created circumstances in which black male bodies have come to be valuable entertainment commodities. And that's the thing that people don't like talking about with this slave comparison. For the boys who were commodified on playgrounds and middle school basketball courts, their dream is to one day make it to the league to play at that high level and to make millions in the process. And I want to be clear, that's a desirable reality to hold. I will trade in YouTube real quick to be Patrick Mahomes. But what we don't see is the connective tissue that still keeps this system together and the numerous holes in the facade and the continuing exploitation of these athletes, even when they're millionaires. In another underrated sports movie, Any Given Sunday, we again follow an ensemble cast of stories that embody the numerous realities and pitfalls facing these millionaire professional athletes. In it, we see Jamie Foxx's Willie Beeman, a journeyman backup quarterback who is still young but has minimal expectations at a big payday because he didn't embody what a pro football quarterback looked like. And he fully understands that he is playing on borrowed time at this point, and he has to get out of this equation one last big payday to maximize the sacrifice 
he's made. The quarterback of the team gets hurt and Willie Beeman steps in and becomes an instant star. In doing this, he clashes with the established power structures within his team, including other black teammates like Luther LeVay, a wild and unhinged player at the end of his career, playing with an injury that could lead to his death. However, his conversation with Jamie Foxx underscores the level of agency that some of these players manage to maintain once they get to this level and the complex reality that they have to face. Suddenly there's no more money, no more winning, no more applause. No more dream. When a man looks back on his life, he should be proud of all of it. Not just years he spent the pads and cleats. You gotta learn that will in here. Or if you don't, you ain't a man. You're just another punk. When LeVay says you're not a man, you're just another punk. The point he's trying to make is that for Beeman, it's not just enough to get the best you can out of the system to get your money. Because in doing that, you might end up just like him, playing with a life-threatening injury because you need that last bit of money. What he wants Beeman to do is to recognize that the game is a game and that you don't have to be a pawn. And this is a message you see from real life players as well. It's a vulnerable time for a lot of these young dudes, you feel me? If they was me, or if I had an opportunity to let these little, uh, Young Sahibs know something. I say, take care of y'all money, African, because it don't last forever. Now. So while y'all at it right now, take care of y'all bodies. You know what I mean? Don't take care of y'all chicken. You feel me? Don't take care of y'all mentals, because look, we ain't lasting that long. Um, you know, I had a couple of players that I played with that, you know what I mean? They no longer here no more. They no longer. And I think this reflects the growing space of like self-help podcasts and media for men that are being made by former athletes. You have Mike Tyson's podcast that I think may have recently ended, plus I Am Athlete with Brandon Marshall and a bunch of other players. These are men who have been abused and used by these systems that after their playing days have made it a goal to seek wellness in the aftermath, wellness that they felt like they were forced to avoid while they were playing. And the question is, why is that? Why do so many players know that they're doing something exploitative, but avoid addressing that exploitation while they're playing? And part of that is because that breaks that hegemonic hold of them as athletes, as these buck embodiments. Because as soon as these players step out to do something they're not supposed to do, they're merely told to shut up and play. And if they don't, many of them are taken off of the board. The obvious case for this to bring up is Colin Kaepernick, who was blackballed after protesting the national anthem in 2016, and to date has not played another down of football in the NFL, despite obviously being talented enough to do so. Kaepernick, however, was not alone or new in that regard. Black athletes have a legacy of using their star power to fight for racial injustice. Before Kaepernick, you had Sharif Mahmoud Raouf, Craig Hodges, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Muhammad Ali. And almost every time when these black athletes step out of line, there are immediate consequences. Muhammad Ali, for example, lost several years of his career because he refused to register for the draft to fight in Vietnam, stating that there's no reason for a black man to fight for this country that doesn't treat them as an equal. Niggas is only woke when it's safe. You know what I mean? Like, and that's what bothers me. Like, you, you, like nobody, and that's what I did respect about Cat when he did what he did was it was, it wasn't safe when he did it. You know what I mean? And anybody that joined him at the time, it wasn't safe. And so there was like six of us that joined him. And it wasn't until the next year that everybody joined and locking hands right. and shit. And it's like, I don't want to discourage or, or disparage people for, you know, because a lot of people's jobs on the line. I understand. I get it. But like, it's, it's it's bothersome to me that that I think the only I mean if, if you look it's just it's just it's just the the, the history of our country it's just the history of the world if yeah. if if you're not willing to stand on something or or, or 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 really go to bat for something like there's gonna be no change and that way Kaepernick and these other guys required that they were not just seen as professional athletes but as men who play professional sports as not these chattel buck embodiments but as human beings with emotions opinions and needs. And it's a growing trend in the NFL and the NBA, a trend that I don't know if the league is really happy about, but that's easy to get behind. The real challenge when it comes to thinking about the way we perceive these black men in this very unique, very complex situation is what happens when their behavior is not easy to digest. 
The real challenge is talking about a guy like Antonio Brown. Brown has had one of the more dominant NFL careers for the last decade plus, breaking several records and being a superstar in the process. However, in the last couple of years, Antonio Brown has become a bizarre sideshow. I won't get too deep into all of his behavior. It's all pretty ugly and problematic. He's done some things that just make him look silly. He's done some things that are pretty ugly. He's done some things that border on abuse and violence towards women. He's done some things that are maybe pornographic. I don't, I don't know. I don't know all the details for all the stories, but the key thing that I want to bring out is that it seems like all of this is the result of the game he's being paid to play. Flimlo did a deep dive on Antonio Brown, and I'll link that in the description. But one of the things he postulates is the fact that Antonio Brown, for most of his career, was seen as one of the NFL good guys. He wasn't really known as this diva sideshow crazy wide receiver. And then he took this hit. Brown is still down. And pretty much from the moment that this hit was over, he's been a B, this completely different figure in the NFL. And I don't want this to come off as an excuse because we don't know the full science of head trauma and CTE. We do have at least historical, circumstantial, and anecdotal evidence that CTE definitely does affect the behavior of these men. We've seen numerous suicides and bouts of depression of these players, and we know that head trauma can lead to behavioral changes. Real quick, I just want to jump on here. Uh, I am here at the new editing bay in my dining room. And just make sure I'm being very clear because I'm talking about a man with a very complex and complicated history um, with a lot of ugly moments uh, involved in it. As I talk about Antonio Brown's uh, trauma, both his head trauma and his previous trauma as a child or trauma existing in this plantation athlete system, um, I don't want it to be misconstrued that I'm trying to make excuses for his behavior. His behavior should be explained in part by the system he exists in and the trauma that he's been through, but it is still not okay and not to be condoned under any circumstances. Further, I want to be clear, although I think it is very plausible to look at the injury that he suffered in 2017 as a key component to his uh, deterioration as an individual, that's just a theory that is plausible, but speculative at this point. And when we're talking about a man, what is, you know, complicated, a reality is Antonio Brown. And this story continues to develop. And by the time this comes out, God knows what will have come out. And so I don't want to be on record like defending Antonio Brown. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm trying to do is explain. And I think this comes to on the rest of the, the this section that regardless of how you feel about Antonio Brown, recognize that his existence is explicitly tied to the racist, anti-black uh, patriarchal framework that he is working within. And that if we hyper-focus on Antonio Brown's bad behavior, we're gonna essentially miss the forest for the trees. And we can do both. We can seek appropriate punishment or justice for Antonio Brown and recognize that his behavior is directly tied to and a byproduct of what he's been through up until this point, including his time in the NFL. And we need to be able to do that. We can't just be able to fight for guys like Colin Kaepernick who are perfect victims. The reality is the dysfunction that black men are experiencing in this country is not going to let a lot of us look like Colin Kaepernick. Most of that dysfunction is going to look more like Antonio Brown. And if you can't fight for both, then you're really not fighting for anybody. So, but I want to critically engage with what's happening here. Before Antonio Brown started going crazy in the last decade or so, the NFL had been inundated with bad press for what felt like years with guys like Pac-Man Jones and Michael Vick. And there has been a public outcry for that entire time for these black groups to be brought under heel. And NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell for the last 15, 20 years has had this Reagan Clinton-esque tough on crime policy of reform. And this has resulted in unilateral power for him to punish players who behave poorly. 
Again, I don't want to defend the actions of these players because for most of them, these are really awful things for anybody to do. But I do want to ask what is actually occurring when we have players like Vic, like Pac-Man Jones, like Antonio Brown get suspended. Cases like Antonio Brown's are extreme, but there's been plenty of cases over the years of really bad behavior by NFL players. And each time the NFL responds in the same way, they vilify the individual and then they put them out the league. But what they don't do is engage in the work of providing a different level of support for these players within and without the league. Players that have again been weaned on this dehumanizing hypermasculine performance of gender since they were preteens. And this is because that's what the NFL wants. The sport of football is violent and brutal. The damage these men do to their bodies or their girlfriends and spouses or to dogs is again just collateral damage in the billion dollar machine that is the NFL. And the thing I want people to take away when talking about ugly and complex situations like Antonio Brown or Ray Rice is that it's not about saying that what they did is OK and reasonable within the context of what their challenges are. It's about recognizing that these issues of sexual violence and violence against women and physical trauma and depression and substance misuse and suicide are all connected to the same patriarchal framework that these men are expected and taught to embody again from the time that they are children. So as good as it is for the NFL to punish Antonio Brown, understand that this is plantation sports. Antonio Brown is a wild buck that does not have the ability to function in this structure anymore. And instead of giving him the help that he needs, the NFL is going to cut him loose. And I'm praying that somewhere within his support system, somebody is able to get him together. All of the apathy I built up over the years, I had to slowly start chipping away at because what it started doing was started ruining my, it already had ruined a lot of relationships in my life, but I didn't care because I was about to get his money, right? right? I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it, right? But I had to slowly start chipping away because I saw my mother's, uh, my relationship with my mother start deteriorating. I felt funny hugging my mother. I'm, I'm kind to myself in that aspect where it's like, I, I, that was what I developed over the years in pure as a self-defense mechanism. Yeah. But in, in retirement, that's what I've done. I've really just sat back and, and, and been able to peel back layer by layer what I have become and what I have done in my life. And, 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 and football is just a small part of it, right? Which brings me to my final and really the core element in all of this, us, which kind of also still includes me the fans. Whenever we are critical of some form of media, it's too easy to just be critical of the creation of that media. We also have to remember that the media in question is meant to appeal to a specific fan base and the fan base is reflective of the greater societal problems. Now, of course, the NFL, the NBA, et cetera, make the most money out of this situation. So it's easy to point the finger at them, but they make that money from us. We are the biggest issue here. The NFL doesn't really care about violence against women or the national anthem in 2016 or police brutality in 2020. What they care about was their advertising dollars and ticket sales. The NBA doesn't care about what's happening to the people in China. Clearly, what they care about is the money to be extracted from that situation. And we as the people are the fulcrum that leans on. And to me, the reality is that we, the fans, are too comfortable with the status quo of this system. I want to reiterate that I'm not against sports or the elements of sports culture that surrounds it. But capitalism has done and is doing to sports what it does to pretty much everything. It's mutilating it to make it more easy to extract said capital. And the solution to me isn't to stop watching sports, but to as fans of the sports to demand that the status quo not be so closely adhered to. And I say this partially because, yeah, I don't I'm not going to stop watching. Football is deep in my veins from watching on Sundays to Madden to fantasy football to watching guys like Flimlo Raps along with, I don't know, Brett Coleman, Pro Football Focus, etc. I and many others consume sports like Gen Z kids consume K-pop and just like the complex brutal and exploitative nature of k-pop there are levels to how you engage as a fan and what you can be doing to address the problem 
And for me, the reality is that we have to start engaging with the nature of white supremacy and how sports and black athletes reproduce those frameworks. The NFL, NBA, NCAA, they don't hinge on my dollars. All the people that are still not watching the NFL because of what they did to Colin Kaepernick, that's dope. I'm not telling you to stop, but the white people and the fans make your dollars not all that significant to the bottom line. And those fans are coming into this sports with the same biases and anti-black attitudes that they carry in real life. And you can see that historically when you look at the NBA strikes of the 90s and the near strike from the NFL a couple of years ago, or even that case with Ed O'Bannon and NCAA football, the video game. As soon as the access to these sports is challenged because the players are seeking greater compensation and more power over their labor, the fans always side with the billionaires. They always call the players greedy and say shit like they should be grateful to ever get to the spot they're in in the first place. They never complain about the exploitative institutions that have been making billions off of these players for decades without paying them a dime. And it happens because sports and the black men who play in them create this perfect environment for dehumanization, commodification, and fetishization for the enjoyment of these fans. We marvel at the performances of these amazing athletes. We love the physiological intensity and the emotional responses to the game. But we want this, especially some of these fans, to be controlled and contained within the sport aimed only at the opposing team with no room for error, fully under the control of white men and white institutions. And furthermore, they don't want any responsibility to take care of these players once the game is over. It's a really complicated, impossible to parse through situation. But in the middle of all of this, are the players in the margins, the pros with short injury riddled careers who don't make millions, the college players who never get a shot but have some of the same damage that the pro players do. Those kids that cap out at high school and have to process their dreams being deferred and the children, the literal children who just like playing a sport. In the middle is Seku, my eight year old son who likes Minecraft, soccer and basketball who will or already is dealing with the dehumanizing reality of existing in a racialized black male body with the extra addition of happening to look athletic. Me, Arian and Flimlo all love our sports, but we all also have sons. And when we were interviewing, there were these moments where we were just kind of overtaken by the gravity of the conversation we were having where we were thinking about how to negotiate this world that will treat our sons as commodities and how we might protect them from this hard to describe danger of them just loving a game. And as usual, there's no easy answer to the question of how to do that. There's no easy answer to how to make this situation better. It's just something I want you all to keep in mind as you watch the national championship game or March Madness or the NFL playoffs that these aren't just automatons or animals moving about on your screens. These are men and boys who just happen to be born to embody this racialized conceptualization of black masculinity, that these are humans who play a game and deal with the same range of challenges that we all do, and they need and deserve better than what they are getting. So this video used clips from the docu-series Fourth and Forever Muck City. The series looks at the titular Muck City, a legendary rural area in the southern Everglades of Florida that has produced more NFL players per capita than any area in the country. It follows the coaches, athletes, and families of the people within this city and engages with that complex nature of black boys in athletics and athletic spaces. It's a pretty awesome series that really helps kind of provide more context to that world of just being a young black boy looking up to and participating in athletics. And you can watch the entire series on CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is an online streaming platform with thousands of documentaries curated for the best in educational filmmaking. And you can get access to CuriosityStream by clicking the link in the description of this video and receive a one-year subscription along with a one-year subscription to Nebula. 
Nebula is an independent streaming platform made up of some of your favorite educational YouTube creators. Creators like myself have joined together to make Nebula a place where you can watch this video without seeing this actual ad, or any ads for that matter. On Nebula, you get access to versions of your favorite videos and content creators, minus ads, concerns about following algorithm trends, or the numerous things that we have to do to make sure our videos are optimized for regular old YouTube. And you can get access to Nebula and CuriosityStream in a package deal for less than $15 with a 26% discount that you can find if you follow the link in the description of this video. Thank you so much to CuriosityStream and Nebula for supporting content creators like myself and making it possible for this video in particular to come to fruition. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Peace. I don't know if it's Pearl. Yeah, come come get him for me, please. Alright, what is she doing? He's literally purring on the mic. Like. <laughs> <laughs> he probably was like a little 10 minutes of No, because he's gonna curl up by my feet and he's gonna oh, purr. Just slowly take his thing. He had one of the most dominant. No. No. Go get this cat. All right, I'll just I'll just fight with him. See this manifested in some sports movies from this time period. For example, the movie Blue Chips from 1994 stars Nick Nolte as college basketball legendary coach or something, Pete Bell, that have good enough players. The best players aren't coming to play for his team. And he realizes 